بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد مدير بابز السشر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so I want to start off today's discussion just uh, by giving a, a brief background on how it's going to function. I'm going to be speaking for about half an hour to uh, 40 minutes max, and then the rest of the time I want to have active discussion on your particular thoughts. Now, the way this topic came about, in the last couple of weeks there's been a lot of big things that have happened online, that everyone and their uncle has been like talking about it. And the big one that everyone was talking about was a Muslim sister being interviewed by Playboy magazine. Like in fact, if you look that up on Twitter, there's literally hundreds of thousands of people that have commented on that issue. A second thing that happened, but wasn't as popular as that issue, is something which is probably even more alarming. But it didn't get too much attention just because this was picked up so much. And that was the issue of an MSA in the United States of America that has 15 members that are a part of its like board or, or of directors. And out of these 15, 14 of them were pushing to have a Muslim queer day, meaning a Muslim homosexual day. The president of the MSA was against this, and they had a vote, and the majority won, 14 against one, and the president of the MSA actually resigned. Now, for me, this was something very, very concerning. What makes it even more concerning, is let's step back even further, I was in Medina a couple of weeks back, and I was meeting a, a friend of mine, Dr. Tahir White, or he's going to be a, a doctor soon, Tahir White. He's the only English-speaking uh, presenter in Al-Masjid Al-Nabwi. And we're talking about, you know, where is the Muslim identity in America going? And he shared a very scary statistic with me. There is an organization that, you know, focuses on collecting data. They collect statistics. And they did a survey where they asked, you know, about 10,000 Muslims do you believe that Christians and Jews are going to be going to paradise? Right? Very simple question, and we should know where our faith stands on this. 56% of the 10,000 people, that's 5,600 people, actually said yes, they believe that Christians and Jews were going to be going to paradise. So, a couple of weeks back when, we, when I was thinking about my own halakha topics, I presented that I want to have community discussion, because I believe it's very, very important for this to be not a unilateral discussion, not just me speaking and you guys listen. But I want to talk and I want you guys to critique what I have to say as well as give your own feedback. Now before I actually get into my case study of the whole sister interview with Polybar magazine, I want to share one other thing with you. In May 2006, Google released statistics on which countries view the most amount of pornography. And I want to share with you their top 10 countries. Um, actually, here we go. So, six of them were Muslim. Pakistan was on top, and the other Muslim countries were Egypt at number two, Iran at number four, Morocco at number five, and Saudi Arabia at number seven, and Turkey at number eight. The non-Muslim states were Vietnam at number three, India at number six, Philippines at number nine, and Poland at number ten. Now, they did even a more specific statistic on what were the words that these countries were searching. So the following words turned out to be number one in Pakistan. Pig sex, donkey sex, dog sex, cat sex, horse sex, cow sex, goat sex, animal sex, snake sex, monkey sex, bear sex, elephant sex, and fox sex. These are the number one words related to sexuality that are being searched on Google. Out of the top ten countries in the world, six of them are Muslim. This is in May 2006. So now when we talk about, you know, there being problems in the Muslim community, I definitely think we're not addressing those problems enough. I was speaking to another individual this week, and we're talking about, you know, um, prison systems, and people that get incarcerated. How many Muslims do you think are in the incarceration system? How many Muslims do you actually think get arrested? And we would think not that money, right? Muslims are good, law-abiding citizens. But the reality is, the prison system and the incarceration system is reflective of the population. 
So the more a population grows, the more reflective it becomes, right? If you were to take Toronto as a case study, this was something I was able to look up. In 1984, they said approximately 6% of uh, incarcerated individuals in Canada's prison systems were uh, Muslim. That's in 1984. Right, so you move forward 20 some odd years. Here we are in 2016, and that number has jumped up to 15%. That means more than one out of 10 in prison is actually Muslim. That's a scary reality. Like something is definitely going wrong. And these aren't terrorism charges that we're talking about. Like those can be trumped up. But we're talking about actual theft, actual assaults, actual robbery, and a whole bunch of other crimes. There is a huge crisis in the Muslim community and we're not discussing this enough. So what I'm hoping for is in the next couple of weeks, as I'm doing my halakas, each week we're going to choose a particular topic and discuss that. And I'll present a case study and then we can discuss it back and forth. So what I want to study for today was the issue of the sister interview with Playboy magazine and why I believe it was incorrect. Why I believe it was incorrect. So the first point I want to start off by discussing is the issue of Playboy magazine itself. Playboy magazine went through uh, a branding restructuring a couple of years back. And that branding restructuring consisted of that they were no, going to, no longer going to feature nudity in their magazine. They're no longer going to feature nudity in their magazine. Now, why did they do this? That's the first question you want to ask. When you look at the viewing of pornography, Statistics actually show that no one is actually actively buying pornography anymore. But rather people view it online for free. And therefore, it wasn't a conscious moral decision that they made that they're no longer going to show full-fledged nudity. But rather, it was a business decision. More and more people are buying lifestyle magazines. More and more people want to know about fashion. More and more people want to know about trends that are happening. And that is the direction it took. Now the reason why I bring up this issue it's because a lot of Muslims will argue online, but Playboy no longer features nudity, so therefore it should be okay. But I believe this is very naive. Because Playboy is not just a magazine, but in reality, it is a whole franchise that consists of you know, multiple departments. They actually have an online channel, and they have a TV viewing channel, which is still full-fledged pornography. So its actual industry is based upon the exploitation of women. And this is something that as a Muslim, you can never stand for. And that's why I found this argument that was made to be very, very naive. Number two, when we talk about this issue of even though it took away the nudity, does this actually change anything in the greater scheme of things? Right? And even if it did, is it justified for Muslims to actually be a part of it? I want you to think of a more clear example. If I told you, hey brothers, tonight we're going to get together and we're going to go and give dawah at a strip club, right? We're going for the sake of dawah. Would we accept that? No, we wouldn't. Because we understand the basics of a righteous intention is not enough to rectify a bad action in and of itself. So now here an individual that claims, oh, but we're giving dawah through Playboy magazine. We're representing and empowering Muslim sisters through this article. That argument makes no sense whatsoever. Because we have a simple principle in fiqh, an niyatu saliha la tuslihu al amal al fasid. That a righteous intention will never rectify a bad action. So that is the first criticism that, or the first defense rather, that I am responding to. Number two, it was argued that this is empowering for hijabi women. And in fact, when you look at the article itself, the sister speaks about her being wearing hijab and her having ambitions to become uh, you know, a media representative and a spokesperson and a news anchor and you know that she is one of the first women that wears hijab that is going to be able to do this. What I want to discuss on this point is what is our understanding of hijab? And what do we need to have an honest discussion on? One of the things that kept being brought up again on social media is no man has a right to tell a woman how to dress. This statement looks like a pretty positive statement that as men, we should not be dictating what our sisters, what, what our female counterparts in the community wear. That's not a man's responsibility to do that. But is that the actual focus of this statement? Is that what they're actually trying to achieve? No. It's not only, not only should man not decide what women get to wear, but it's also that 
You have the right to wear whatever you want, whenever you want. Islamically, that is a problematic statement. Because when it comes to the way we dress, part of our sharia, part of our code of law, part of our ethics, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what is awrah. What are the parts that need to be covered? Now one of the mistakes that we've made in this day and age, is that hijab has become a piece of cloth. If someone, if a sister wears something that covers her head, automatically she is wearing hijab. And in fact, this is not the case. Let's just go back to the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about women's clothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses two terms. He uses the term khimar, and he uses the term jilbab. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term hijab, He actually uses it in terms of when you speak to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, speak to them while they're behind a hijab, meaning behind a barrier. So the term hijab does not come in the context of clothing, but rather it comes in the context of barrier. So now when you move forward, the concept of hijab as it developed, it encompasses not only the way a sister dresses, but it encompasses a lifestyle that both men and women are meant to have. And that is a lifestyle of modesty. That anything that is considered obscene, anything that is considered lewd, anything that would be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a Muslim should not be a part of that. And that is what hijab consists of. Now what really bothered me is that the individuals that defended this issue, they had no problem with the way they made the sister pose. They had no problem the way they made the sister pose. If you read like analysis of the magazine of this article, they actually show how the sister was meant to pose. And it's a very provocative pose. I mean, it's not that she's just standing there wearing hijab. They actually made her pose in a very provocative way, which I found very, very befit- uh, unbefitting. And the reason why I say that is because they're again tied back to the history and culture of Playboy magazine in exploiting women. There is a huge industry of fetish out there where people are actually attracted to these sort of things. And the fact that one of our sisters is pulled into this propaganda is not befitting at all. So when we say that this is empowering of hijab, we have to understand what we're talking about. Disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and minimizing hijab just to a cloth on the head is not you know, befitting of a Muslim to say. Right? Hijab is a lifestyle, it's not just a cloth. And it is a lifestyle that both Muslims and women, uh, both men and women have to abide by. Right? Women have the physical component of it, but we both have the spiritual component of it. Where both men and women are commanded that when you speak to the opposite gender, lower your gaze. Right? Women are commanded that don't make your voices provocative when you speak to the opposite gender. All those guidelines are, are given. So you have to keep in mind that when we talk about hijab, it's not just a cloth on your head. It is a religious identity symbol that people use to identify as Muslims, to be you know, openly subservient, not to the creation, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, the issue of women's rights. Now, this is always a sensitive topic, and I want to explain why. I want to be one of the first people to confess and to, to talk about that the way Muslim sisters are treated is very, very problematic. You go to the average masjid, and those masajid, sisters areas of them at least are dungeons. They're not properly lit, they have no access to the imam, their spaces are very small, they're given like a small corner, and there's no engagement with the sisters. You want to make things even worse? If a sister wants to get divorced from her husband, due to valid reasons, she actually has very little discord or recourse to actually do that. To find an imam that will grant her divorce is next to impossible, right? Even when I look at our situation in Calgary, it's deplorable, like I don't understand why it's like that. That if a sister is in a difficult situation and she needs out of her marriage, why is it that as a community we can't grant that to her? When you want to look at access to education, how many halaqat are there exclusively for sister? Right, there's very few halaqat that are exclusively for sisters. You know, we tried something during the, the summer months this year at the ISC, where we had a halakha exclusively for sisters to see how the sisters would respond. Right? Sisters always say that, hey, if you provide opportunities, we'll come and learn. And teaching that halakha, I found that it was an amazing experience. And in fact, when you look at female students versus male students, female students are a thousand times better than male students. And actually makes you want to teach more females than it does males because they actually pay more attention. They take better notes, they're more engaged, they like to have more positive discussion, right? But the reality is, again, we haven't provided those resources. And this is just, you know, the, the service of the discussion. 
So as a community, we are lacking in providing resources and catering to their needs and catering to their wants and in providing facilities to them. While this shortcoming is there, what is the appropriate response? The appropriate response should not be that we start talking about how men and women are equal. That is not the appropriate response. That we now start wanting women to do the role of men and we want men to do the role of women. No matter how hard a man tries, he will never be able to give birth to a baby. No matter how hard a man tries, he will never be as good of a caretaker as a woman. No matter how hard a man tries, in the realm of teaching, there will never be as many good men teachers as there are female teachers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled inside women a natural compassion, a natural mercy, a natural ability to teach that He didn't instill inside men. And this is one of the problems in our day and age that we've become so busy competing with one another that we forget we're meant to complement one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create men and women to do the same things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men to do the things that women can't. And created women to do the things that men can't do. And that is how we're meant to live together. But social agendas have come, economic agendas have come, and it created that divide. That we want to make everyone equal. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us clearly in the Quran, that man is not like woman. Right? That, that, distinguish, that distinguishing factor has to be there. This leads us into the discussion of Islamic feminism. Can that actually happen? Can they coexist? Now when we talk about Islam, this is a defined term. This is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fulfilling the five pillars. That is the definition of Islam. But when we talk about feminism, this is something that is undefined. In fact, when we look throughout the ages, it actually becomes more, I guess, aggressive as it goes on. To, it becomes to a state where they literally become hateful of men, subhanAllah, in certain feminist circles. So when we talk about our Islam and feminism compatible, the discussion we want to have is, what do we mean by feminism over here? Certain elements of feminism will be compatible. Right? Fighting for the rights that Allah has given them? Yes, we should fight for the rights that Allah has given them. And make sure that they have fair treatment and that they have good treatment. But once we go beyond those boundaries, that feminism actually becomes a form of oppression. Right? There's a nice quote by Sheikh Salman al awda He says, get, don't get so addicted to your freedom that you become a slave of it. Right? Don't fight for so much freedom that you become a slave to your freedom. And I believe that's what's happened in the feminist world right now is that they are fighting so often for their rights that they've forgotten what the ultimate goal is. Having ultimate liberation and freedom is not a good thing. You leave mankind to their vices, they will destroy civilization. Even with rules and regulations now, we've still found a way to destroy ourselves. Imagine if there were no rules. And that is why as a Muslim, one of the things you should proud yourself in is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a code of conduct. This is how you live your life. This is your code of ethics. These are the boundaries that Allah has set. These are the parameters you have to stay within. And rather than feeling sad and apologetic and bad about these things, you should feel happy that your Creator has told you what to do. You don't have to figure it out for yourself. Because if you were left to those devices to yourself, we would destroy mankind, which is what we're actually seeing. So now, when we talk about how this woman was a step, well, sorry, this article was a step forward for women's rights, in fact, I believe it was a step backwards. Because again, we furthered the agenda of female exploitation through sexuality. And this goes back not only through choosing a specific Muslim sister and making her pose a certain way, but in fact using that avenue in a magazine. Right? There's multiple online sources that can be used where we can talk about women's rights and furthering the agenda of protecting women from harm. We didn't have to use this avenue. So I believe it was more of a step backwards than a step forward. A next point that was raised was that in 1960, or in the 1960s, both Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali interviewed with Playboy magazine. Why is it that we're not condemning them as equally? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that this magazine is an exploitation of women and not an exploitation of men. Number two is that hijab is a religious symbol and therefore the person that wears this hijab becomes identifiable as Muslim right away. 
when Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X did their article in Playboy magazine, they were still both a part of the nation of Islam and had not accepted Islam at that time. Number three is I actually believe this is a moot point, a point that has no value whatsoever. Because our religion is not based upon the actions of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, but rather it is based upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said. Right? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولُ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولُ That all you who believe, obey Allah, obey the Messenger of Allah, and those in authority amongst you. If you ever differ in any matter, who should we turn it back to? Should we turn it back to Muhammad Ali? Should we turn it back to Malcolm X? Turn it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we justify this action by saying, previous predecessors have done this act, and therefore it is okay, and you have to equally condemn them, just like you're equally condemning the sister, I believe that's not a valid point at all. Because while they are, they died upon Islam, they are not, you know, at the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're human at the end of the day. Right? That's what my khutbah was about today. Every human being will make mistakes. You look into the Qur'an, Every prophet is identified by a mistake they have made. Adam eating from the tree, Musa unintentionally killing someone, Ibrahim deceiving to the degree that he could have been lying, Yunus alayhi salam abandoning his community. All of these things were there to show that human beings, even at the level of prophethood, make mistakes. So therefore, going back to those that are not even prophets and using them as a proof is nonsensical. Now, the concluding remarks that I want to share over here. Number one, is on an individual level, how do we protect our own guidance? Right? It's very easy to say that the world is becoming misguided, but what is our proactive approach to making sure that we ourselves remain guided? Right? How do we do that? Number one, is let us focus on the verse in Surah Fatiha, إِهْدِنَ الصَّرَاطَ mustaqim, That Allah guides us to the straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this verse for multiple reasons. Number one, to show us the importance of asking guidance, even at the level of prophethood, even at the level of sahabi, they were asked to do this. Constantly ask for guidance. And that is why 17 times a day, you will be asking for guidance in your prayer. Because it is the most valuable and cherishable thing that you have. Part of making dua for guidance, are other duas that the Prophet ﷺ made. From the most important of them, are two. Ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala dinik. That, O oh Allah, turn of the hearts, turn my heart towards your religion, and keep it firm upon your religion. And the second of them is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Allahumma arini al-haqqa haqqan, warzukni attiba'ah. Wa arini al-batila batilan, warzukni ijtinaba. That, O oh Allah, show me the truth for what it is, and allow me to follow it. And show me falsehood for what it is, and allow me to abstain from it. So asking for guidance consistently. And making sure that you do this on a regular basis. Number two, understanding the circle of guidance. What do I mean by the circle of guidance? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran that those that are guided, those that have iman, we will increase them in guidance. What does this mean exactly? Each and every single day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us opportunities to increase our guidance. Waking up for fajr, is an opportunity for guidance. When you accept that responsibility and you wake up for fajr, you increase your guidance and open up the doors for guidance. When you wake up and you hear the alarm go off and you're like, you know what, I'll pray later and you turn it off, you've closed the doors for guidance and guidance actually gets snatched away from you. And you need to view guidance almost as a pyramid, almost as a building block that the more opportunities that are presented to you to take guidance and you accept them, the more your guidance will increase. But the more opportunities that are given to you and you close them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala snatches away that, right, uh, that guidance. كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِ مَا كَانُوا اكسبون. But rather it is the darkness of their hearts that has encompassed their hearts due to the deeds that they used to commit. And that is the ultimate reality. So when Allah gives you those opportunities of guidance, you have to accept them. Number three, understanding what your role as a Muslim is in terms of discussing ethics and morality. As a Muslim, like I keep telling you, we can't keep going on to our own understanding of morality. Our understanding of morality and ethics is not something that evolves. It's something that is set in stone. 
right? The way we implement that morality is a different thing. But in terms of what is halal and what is haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that clear to us when the final verse of the Qur'an, right? Morality will not change after that. So therefore, when we talk about these issues, it's always important that we understand our own reference points. We always understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam want us to understand. And that will only be done by all of us seeking knowledge together. So just like you're here today, make sure you constantly attend regular halakat. It doesn't have to be at this masjid. No one's telling you to do that. But even if it's online, even if it's at other masajid, when there are books and you know, things being taught, actively pursue them. Because the, the second you disconnect from sources of revelation, that is when misguidance begins. Ultimate guidance is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That's what the Prophet ﷺ tells us. That as long as you hold on to the Qur'an and that which is similar to it, you will remain guided. So always keep going back to the Qur'an and Sunnah and keep learning. And those are three things I wanted to emphasize. Now in terms of where are we headed? In terms of where we're headed as a Muslim community, things look very dismal. And that's the, the, the honest reality of it. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that towards the end of time, the only thing that people will remember, remember about Islam is that when they hear La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they will say this is something our forefathers used to say. And now when you look at what's happening on the ground, this is really where we're heading. So each individual has the opportunity or rather the obligation to protect themselves. And this obligation needs to be taken very, very seriously. Now we have a responsibility as a community that when we become parents, we instill Islamic values into our children, right? That even if they end up going to public school, it's very important to discuss with them what are the boundaries of Islam? What are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to be halal and haram? And we can't shy away from that discussion. Like we've seen the effects of shying away from discussions where Muslims now believe that, you know, regardless of your faith, you're going to be entering into paradise. If a person has this mindset, why would they actively want to pursue Islam? Because they already believe that they're going to paradise. So Islamic values and Islamic laws, they need to be presented in its truest form, but with the utmost amount of wisdom. Right? Just because we believe in religious exclusivity in terms of salvation, it doesn't mean that we're condescending towards other individuals. Which leads me to my last point. Please notice that throughout this whole time, I didn't mention the sister's name. And I did that intentionally. Because I don't want this discussion to be about an individual from our community. From a sister that is my sister in Islam. That I still love and respect for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I disagree with her. I don't like what she did. And I don't agree with those that supported her. But at the end of the day, she is still my sister in Islam. And I will die defending her if I have to. So this discussion is not about a sister. It is about the actual topic itself. And that is something that is so important to remember. That in your journey of progression and of Islam, you will do things that people don't agree with. And you will see people do things that you don't agree with. Shaitan wants to come and split the community by us attacking one another. The way a community grows is that we understand and realize that we can still differ in our perspective, but we will still love and respect one another. And that's what needs to be revived. So any slander of the sister will not be tolerated. Any name calling of the sister will not be tolerated. Right? So we have to understand those boundaries that we do not conquer one haram with another haram. In fact, the mistake of slandering her and backbiting her is much much worse than the mistake that I believe that she made. And we need to understand that. Backbiting in Islam is a major sin. Slander is much much worse. So shaming people publicly online is not acceptable. It is absolutely not acceptable. And our discussion should always be about points and not about individuals. And at the end of the day, our love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what should take precedence, right? Just because we disagree, it doesn't mean we have to hate each other and destroy the community. So those are just some of the points I wanted to share with you. And I want to hear what you guys have to say about this topic. Is there something that I left out that needs to be addressed? Or do you have a different point of view? In fact, I welcome all different points of view so that everyone can learn and grow in this, inshallah. So we have a portable mic over here. And particularly from the sisters, if there's anyone that wants to, to share, please by all means do, inshallah. I know it's always difficult to raise your hand for the first time. So someone bite the bullet and start speaking, inshallah. Here we go. And just pass the mic around, inshallah. 
So my question was not in concerns to the girl, but just because you mentioned it, that uh, in Islam you kind of have to have this barrier. That's what the hijab represents. So now I'm an individual who goes to school and I call, you know, come across this every day, so even today, especially with the Muslim sister, because we have to work on projects and whatnot. Right. So what approach should I take when I discuss? Uh, because, you know, if you're a business student, it says make eye contact when you talk. These are all signs right. of confidence. Right. So what approach should I take when I'm speaking to uh, a female or just Muslim sister in specific? Excellent. What should I do in that case? Excellent. Good question. So now the topic of gender relations. Yeah. Um, one of the goals is, inshallah, we want a presenter to come in and actually give a, a workshop on this topic. I have someone in mind for that already. So we'll have a, a detailed discussion on that much later on. But in terms of summary, let's understand the reality of where we live. We live in a, in a non-Muslim land where they have a different lifestyle as opposed to the Muslim lifestyle. So in an ideal world, even statistics show that men learn better in a male, male setting and females learn better in a female setting. But now that both men and women are working together, this is the reality that we're forced to deal with. How do we work with that reality with an Islamic framework in mind? So we need to understand what the parameters are. Number one, in terms of speaking with the opposite gender, you guys should never be alone. So if you're alone in the library, that shouldn't be happening. If you're alone in the classroom, it shouldn't be happening. There should always be a third party there. Because the third party, if you don't include someone physical, it's going to be shaitan. Number two is in terms of the way that we speak to each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah al He commands both the believing men and the believing women to lower their gaze towards each other, right? To lower your gaze towards the opposite gender. So as a practicing Muslim, both men and women should respect that. So if a man lowers his gaze towards a woman, a woman shouldn't be offended by that. And if a woman lowers her gaze towards a man, the brother shouldn't be offended by that. But in terms of dealing with a non-Muslim world, they will be offended by it. So the way that we will treat a Muslim sister may have to be different. And that is understandable, right? Number three, in terms of physical contact, I'll share a funny story with you. Um, so my, my friend Baba Ali, he lives in California. And he was invited once to an MSA in California, where he walks into the room, and um, there's a sister sitting on the lap of a brother. So he goes, you know, Salaam alaikum Baba Ali, I'm here to, to perform tonight. You know, can you tell me uh, who the president of the MSA is? And the brother that has the sister sitting down on him, he's like, I'm the president. Oh, he's like, mashallah, it's really nice to meet you. And he, uh, I'm like, he's like, is this your wife? And he's like, no, this isn't my wife. And that's when things started getting awkward. Okay, if this isn't your wife, who is this? Oh, she's the vice president of the MSA. <laughs> right? This is the vice president of the MSA. So, when you look at realities like that, again, this topic of gender interactions, like uh, people, uh, like they, they've completely lost... You know, their, their sense of, of grounding, subhanAllah. So physical contact is a definite no-no. Unless there's like an absolute need for it. Someone's dying, yes, by all means go and save them. Someone's drowning, go and save them. But in terms of, if there's no need for it, there, that shouldn't be happening. And then number four, is just the concept of taqwa. Always remember that, hey, how do you think your parents would react to this? And if we really want our parents seeing this, then more than that, we wouldn't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing this, right? So don't do something that you don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing. So always keep that taqwa there, which means no flirting, it means, you know, no constant text messaging, no whatsapping, no skyping, no snapchatting. Like just because it deletes, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to do it, right? All of those things should not be done. So these are just some of the parameters and boundaries that, you know, Muslims in schools particularly need to keep in mind. Allahu ta'ala alam. Good question. Zakallah. Any comments, questions? From. You have a question? I'm just. Uh, can, oh, sorry. I can speak loud. I, you, I you can speak loud? Sure. Yeah, the question is uh, these MS, MSAs? Yes, Muslim Student Association. Oh, students? Okay, yes. Is it like one of those bodies where like, you know, they just sub upholding themselves? Or is it. Uh, you're, 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 you're proving how old you are right now, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like one of those, you know, bodies that went like, no, just... It's not self-appointed. Or is it like something... No, there's elections by Muslims. They're elected by Muslims. Well, can they be like challenged? Or like, when you present something... Right. If you say you represent animals, you have to be like what... But this is what I was trying to tell you, that we had an MSA where 14 out of the 15 people, they said we should have a Muslim queer day. Right? These are elected members of an MSA. 
So over here, the problem, even if we get this individual replaced, another one's going to come in and say the exact same thing or something similar. So what needs to take place is a whole process of tarbiyah needs to be changed. And that's what I'm trying to address is that we need to take this topic very, very seriously. Like, we don't want to live the signs of the Day of Judgment today. We don't want to take pride in that. So uh, that was the part of the, the thing I was trying to get across. But yeah, the MSA, you know, it's supposed to be called Muslim Student Association, but it has like a whole other bunch of acronyms, like Matrimonial Service Association and you know, all sorts of different things. Allah Mustaan. Comments? Sisters, can we get uh, the mic to our sister in the back? Uh, I'll come back to you, inshallah. Just pass it all the way back. You can just pass it all the way back. Yeah. Pass it all the way back. And then Amr, if you can just get your son to, to give her any. And Sister Maria, just raise your hand so he can see you. Thank you. So I just wanted to add to that and maybe you can comment. Of course. Um, so what I see a lot is, I'm sure we have brothers or sisters who uh, we know the deal, right? But then often I would say you deal with a lot of students who perhaps don't come from the, uh, that background. Right. Where they understand the etiquette or they know how to deal with the opposite gender and all that. So what that causes is that the compassion is not there and how to treat others. Right, just like you talked about, we shouldn't uh, be shaming the sister when she decided to go in the magazine, right? Of course. So the same also happens among, I mean, I was a student once and I experienced that myself, right? So I think that's perhaps a bigger problem in my opinion, where you don't have uh, a space where people can come and understand what they've learned may not be the correct thing and how to kind of take them on a learning path. Of course. So if you could help us... Uh, for sure. Tips on that. Inshallah. So one of the points I was talking about in terms of saving ourselves in guidance is that you have to actually be pursuing knowledge. So when people pursue that knowledge, there are avenues where it needs to be disseminated and shared with others. But it also needs to be kept in mind that one day, you are also ignorant and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you, right? So there are other people in that situation as well that perhaps they don't know this matter. Now our responsibility is not towards judging people. We can't tell people you're going to the hellfire or you're going to Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given us that burden, nor are we allowed to do that religiously. And what that means is, when it comes to people's paths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those of us whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us knowledge to, we're meant to take people by the hand and make the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala easy. And not make the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala difficult. Right, I'll give you a beautiful example of this. Jazakallah khair, thank you so much. Is that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he had two scenarios. Both of them were exactly the same. One man, he said, I want to go and kill another individual. No, so he, one man came and said, what is the ruling on killing another individual? And another man came and said, what is the ruling on killing an individual? As for the first man, Abdul Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he tells him that the one who kills another individual, then he has the curse of Allah, the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a prolonged period in the hellfire and multiple other punishments. As for the second individual, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he tells him that if this person repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. His students were very perplexed. Two individuals asking the same question, why two different responses? He says, as for the first man, I saw it on his eyes that he was on a path of revenge. And he was on his way to killing someone, and I wanted to deter him. As for the second individual, I saw in his eyes remorse and regret that he had made this mistake and I wanted to make Tawbah easy for him. And this is what we need to understand that when with dealing with individuals, you can't shame them and humiliate them and speak to them in a condescending manner. It has to be very loving, very merciful, very caring. Right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Particularly in their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sister's point is very, very valid. That a lot of the times, non-practicing people become deterred from interacting with practicing people just because of the way they're meant to feel. As if, you know, their comments aren't valued or they're not welcome to the community or they're not good enough to be a part of the MSA or the masjid. Islam is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of no man or woman. So you come to Islam as you are with the intention of learning, with the intention of progressing. And as long as you're willing to do that, progress at your own pace, but with the intention of continuing to progress. Right? Never 
key, give up the key instinct of learning. You have to keep doing that. Jazakallah khair. Any other comments? So I have a question about... Oh, of that. course, sorry, you are next. I'm so sorry. There you go. So I have a question about the hijab. So my accounting teacher, she's a female. So I have to like stare at her, right? Okay. <laughs> when she's teaching. So I was wondering like, what would you say about it? Okay, so when you're saying that you have to stare at her when she's teaching. Like you have she's, to look at her, like eye contact. Like she's told you make eye contact with me? Or it's just really weird if you don't? <laughs> no, like to learn. To learn? Yeah. So why can't you just look at the blackboard instead of looking at her? I, I think there's like, no, I'm being honest. I'm being honest. Like, I think when we want to find a way out, there always is a way out. Okay. So when you're looking at the opposite gender, it has to be understood. It has to be understood properly. What Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has completely made haram is looking at the opposite gender with desire. As soon as you look at the opposite gender with desire, it's unrestrictedly haram. But if there's no element of desire that is involved then over there you'll take different rulings, right? So in this situation, when you're in an atmosphere of learning, the better etiquette is still to lower your gaze, regardless if you feel the desire or not, right? But in those situations where you don't have to look at it, you can just look at the blackboard, I don't see any harm in that. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Jazakallah khair. Oh yeah, can you pass the mic over here, inshallah? Jazakallah khair. Oh yeah. Uh, I have a question that uh, as we know that uh, in our community females are the most important part of our family because uh, as Hitler said that give me a good mother I will give you a good nation right the same way so do we have any plans or anything to tell uh, guidance for the sister and especially sister as well as the males that uh, how to dress up in new generation because uh, wearing only the hijab is not uh, following the Islam but right. underneath they are wearing tires and skin tight clothing and everything and even some of the Muslims <laughs> I seen that they are dressed like whole European on wearing <laughs> hijab so is there any special halakha or anything you guys having a plan in place or anything that we can tell them uh, briefly in a guidance way of course. that we can uh, so all the new generation the same as we say that uh, Muslim Students Association right. why they are on that set because they not been properly guided from their mothers right. and fathers if parents play their best role right. might be they are not going to be thinking like that of course so the basic things comes from the home and for that reason, I request you that can we have a, some special halakha regarding sure. this? So thing. Let, let me address, address this topic. Number one, in terms of, of guidance for the, for the sisters, this is an avenue we're actively pursuing at the IASC. Like I said, we did a trial phase in the summer where we had a series of six halakhas exclusively for sisters. Men were not allowed at that halakha. And we spoke about issues that were pertaining to women. We wanted to see how it went, what the response was. The response went overwhelmingly well. And it's just about facilitating that now as well. Finding people to teach and finding an avenue where sisters feel comfortable to, to come and learn. So that's something that is being looked into. Number two, in terms of Quran halakas, we already have Quran halakas for the sisters over here. Shaykh Hatim, I think twice a week at this location, he has halakas for, for sisters. And that's something they can come and learn. Now the reason why I mention that, it has nothing to do with the topic of hijab. But when you bring your daughters to an atmosphere of learning, they get to interact with other sisters that are learning. So they will get to learn from their teacher as well as from other sisters as well. So even though it may not be directly related, I think that is something that is very important. Number three, I know that Sheikh Fayaz's wife, Sheikh Noreen Tilly, she teaches uh, seminars from time to time. I've never attended, nor do I know anyone that's attended, but I know that she is trying actively to educate the sisters, so that is something that they can attend as well. But the most important thing, I think you hit the nail on the head, that as parents, we always want to outsource education, right? I'll tell you an honest story. There is an uncle that came to my office, and he's like, you know, my son is really hitting puberty. Can you have the talk with him? And I didn't tell this to him. I spoke to his son right there and then, and it wasn't a problem. But after I spoke to him, I'm like, brother, this is a conversation you need to have as a dad, not me as the imam, right? This is a bonding opportunity for father and son. 
So I think parents need to stop shying away from the problems that are out there. The more you run away from them, the worse the problems are going to get. Now in terms of the issue of hijab, a way our sister dresses underneath her hijab and underneath her jilbab is her priority and her prerogative. As long as she fulfills the requirements of Islam, she's free to dress any way that she wants. Right? While she's living with her parents, her parents can give her advice. While her, she's married, her husband can give her advice. But at the end of the day, we want to nurture that taqwa from inside that I want to do what is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think the more we focus on increasing iman and increasing taqwa, and the more we present positive role models for our sisters, the more they want to be like them. But when you don't have positive role models, and you have this empty vacuum of, let me learn fashion from a magazine, or from pop culture, or from media, then they're going to try to combine, hey, my parents forced me to wear hijab, let me try to combine hijab with this other lifestyle. And the two obviously aren't going to go hand in hand. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Any other, any questions or comments from the sisters? I want someone to disagree with me. I, I must have said something that you did not agree with. Uncle, can I get you the mic? Do you mind passing it to him, inshallah? There you go. The brother sitting in the chair. Jazakallah <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Just, uh, 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 yeah, you are right uh, say, uh, telling the, the current situation of uh, flooding the uh, nudity and all that. In this year, I have seen that whenever I open internet, uh, just I am searching a topic, uh -huh. so many nude sites, they pop up. Hmm. And then, you know, sometimes I am so scared that these, these are uninvited sins. I close my, my, my internet site. Right. And then, you know, I think that I have adults at my home and they can take care of themselves. Right. But where they, they are not the adults, they are kids right. or teens, they, that must be affecting their minds. Of course, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, so, so I think if we are talking about the sisters and the brothers and I must say as well, we should also take care of these uh, teens as well. They've been in the schools of somewhere, we should right. have some links. Of course. Yeah, so because we should start educating them from, from that place. Right. bring up to the level that they should know that this has to be washed and this has not to be washed. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So again, getting back to this issue, uh, from the IIC, we have a girls mentoring group from 12 to 17 that my wife runs. And then we have another sister that runs from 17 and older. So that facility is there. It's just about bringing your kids to those events. So for the girls mentoring group, it's every second Sunday. So every second Sunday, we have um, an education component. And then next Sunday after that is like a social component where they'll go for like archery or for swimming or something like that within, you know, Islamic boundaries. Now in terms of, of the issue over here of what we view online, I think it's almost imperative in this day and age that we install something called a net nanny. And what a net nanny does is that you get to choose a sensitivity rating and if you put like PG-13, then anything that is provocative at all, whether violence related or, or sexuality related or anything else, it gets blocked off automatically. And your children will not have access to that. And I think it's something very important that as parents that allow their children to use the internet, number one, you should be supervising what your child is watching. And if you're not going to be supervising, then at the very least, make sure you have this net nanny. So that's a very good point. Now I want to address uh, a question or that we received over here. It's a question from a sister. And she's asking, why did we open up the barrier between the, the men and the women, particularly considering that we're in the masjid and the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, for multiple reasons. Number one is that uh, we advertise this halakha as a community discussion. And in a community discussion, both men and women need to be able to partake. So when we, we have a barrier that is only one-sided, and only the women can see the men, it creates a, you know, a separation that Islam is not required. It's good to have a barrier. Please don't get me wrong. It's good to have a barrier. But in times of need, you're also allowed to take away that barrier. At the time of the Prophet when they used to pray, they didn't physically separate the men and the women, but the women prayed behind the men, and this wasn't a problem. They entered from a separate door, and they left early, and the men left later, and this is how it functioned. So in this situation, where we're having a community discussion, in order to engage the sisters, I didn't see anything wrong with this. And if it was not a community discussion, I believe we would have left the barrier closed as it was before. But with that having been said, we accommodated to both sisters. 
those sisters that want to sit behind the barrier, we've left space that they can sit behind the barrier. And those sisters that want to be actively a part of the discussion are more than allowed to do that. And we pass the mic back and forth. Trying to show that as Muslims, there is a way to function living with one another within the parameters of Islam without having to build a physical separation. Physical separations are good when people already have the tarbiyah. Up until the time people don't develop the tarbiyah, the physical barrier doesn't do much good. So that was sort of my thinking behind this. But I thank the sister for a comment and asking that question. Number two, we got a question. How do we explain this issue to high school st uh, students uh, or teenagers about buying such magazines? When especially the majority of the people here are teenagers. First of all, I would like to say thank you so much for considering me a teenager. And the majority of the people here, I'm sure we're all flattered that you think we're teenagers. <laughs> but I don't think that is the, the case. We do have a lot of young people. And that's why I try to keep it as sensitive as possible. But what I've learned in my limited experience, and please correct me if you, if you disagree, we can't shy away from topics and discussions, right? Whether you like it or not, your children are going to be getting this education one way or another. Either you can control the discussion and be the first seed that they learn it from, or they learn it from somewhere else that they're taught things that you disagree with and that Islamically aren't valid. So that's what I was hoping for in this discussion and I'm hoping that over the next couple of weeks we continue to have these fruitful discussions. And again, we can't shy away from topics. This is the reality that we're living in. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to have honest and open discussion and inshallah no one gets offended. And like I said, I'm always open to your critique and to your feedback. At the end of the day, it is not me against you or you against me. It is all of us together in one community. And we're all here to learn together inshallah. Amir, can we get you the mic? Who has the mic right now? You want oh, you want actually, sorry, let him go first and then I'll pass it to you. So I have a question to regarding your like, point like uh, when a man talk to a woman, there should be a third person present there. Correct. So now I, I'm a, uh, working in a company, an IT company, and sometimes I have to serve customers. Right? And the customers can be a girl, and sometimes there's one-to-one -one meeting. Yes. And uh, there the rule is actually you the uh, non Muslim and don't know you have to make the eye contact and that's the business struggle, otherwise something is difficult to engage with. Right. So how is the role in this case actually? So I, I answered that question over here. I said when there's definite desire, then you're definitely not allowed to, to, to look at the opposite gender. But as long as there's no desire, you're allowed to engage for the sake of work purposes or for other purposes. So if there's a more important thing going on, you're allowed to converse and talk to them. But the key thing is that there shouldn't be any desire towards that opposite gender at that given time. In terms of being alone with them, then this is something that you should try to avoid. Now I understand, they may not understand where you're coming from, but this is something that you should try to avoid if you're able to. If you're not able to avoid it, then in small instances and cases, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive that as long as you have the taqwa inside, that you don't understand that this is something that is not correct. Right? So if the third of your work is being alone with women, then I would say you need to change jobs. But if this is only in one-off cases, once every couple of weeks, your job is still halal and not a problem, keep the taqwa inside. When you're able to bring someone else with you to your job, that's fine. If you're not able to, Allah is pardoning and forgiving inshallah. So, um, the question here actually sometimes uh, you cannot bring one to one here because in terms of like an uh, employee or company try to like squeeze number of people working in this environment. Right. But uh, most of the major one in my workplace is with glass wall so people can see. Right. So does it help or not? Of course, glass wall helps, leaving the door open helps, having public access all helps for sure. It all makes a difference. Allahu Alam. Can you pass the mic to Amir? And then we'll pass it to Hisham, inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Question. For the sake of... Just for the sake of disagreeing. Only the facility... Exactly. The sake of discussion. Yes. So, you had mentioned that the MSA was having that queer day. So that, that's actually going to be a separate topic about it on itself one day. But please ask your question and I'll summarize it. So the question I have is that we, we know the answer. Like we know that you know, it is haram. But the one thing that popped in my head when you had said that is that the, uh, the incident in Orlando. Yes. And so as parents, I'm going to be looking at my children growing up here. And 
the LGBT thing is going to become mainstream. And it's going to be a very hard discussion to say, okay, well, this is what's considered normal, and I've grown up with this being normal right. in the definition of current society. Right. right. Of course, that's a shifting norm. But as we go to address this, as a parent, I don't have the tools, and nor does my wife have the tools, because we bring our generational... And I was born here, so I'm bringing my own general... Gener- generation biases right. to my children's viewpoint. So my question is the answer that we gave that say, okay, you know what, the queer day, huh, right? These sort of things engaging these questionable sort of, you know, publications and those sorts of things is a problem. But how do we sort of bring them closer? Is que- queer day, is, is that the wrong answer or is queer day the the ability to open up that discussion right. as a source of counseling. Of course. Th- that's kind of my question. It's not to, so, it's not my viewpoint. No, no, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. So, by the way, that wasn't a disagreement. That was a question. <laughs> it's okay, though. Um, so, inshallah, we're going to be having this discussion on a separate day, but what is the Muslim community's response towards dealing with uh, homosexuality as well as homosexual members of the Muslim community? Like, it's a whole hour discussion that we're going to be having at a later date, inshallah. To summarize my discussion, number one, we need to be very clear as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually made haram. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make homosexuality haram within of itself? And I believe this is a question that needs to be understood first and foremost. So if we're talking about the feelings that a person has towards the same gender, then this is something that I believe a person has those feelings, this is beyond their control. They do not have the ability to decide who they feel attraction to and who they don't feel attraction to. Just like a man cannot control his attraction towards a woman, he cannot control his attraction towards a man if it happens to be the case. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made attraction haram, because that is beyond your control. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did make haram is acting upon that attraction. So it's just like outside the scope of marriage, if you were to have a physical relationship with a woman, that is haram, even though you're allowed to have a physical relationship with a woman if she is married to you. Whereas with the same gender, there is no concept of marriage, and therefore it is haram in terms of a physical relationship. Number two, where do we stand as a Muslim community in terms of discrimination? If someone is of a different ethnicity, a different race, a different culture, are we allowed discriminating against them? Right? Islamically, we're not allowed to do those things. So now, same thing in terms of orientation, we have to understand that if a person has a different sexual orientation, sorry, you're stretching? Okay. Uh, if a person has a different sexual orientation, then Islamically, we're not allowed to discriminate them against either. We can't say you're not allowed coming to the masjid. Because like I say, this is not our house. This is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need an avenue to come and learn. So discrimination in our faith based upon you know, these sort of things is not allowed. So when we stand up for human rights, it's equal rights for all human beings, regardless of who and, and, and what they believe and are. Number three, in terms of having these discussions, we have to understand that let's look at the lobbying of the LGBT community. Let's look at how they've lobbied. There's not a single popular TV show that you'll find in this day and age, except that they'll have someone that's openly uh, from the LGBT community. And that is such strategic and smart lobbying. So now what this means is, you need to start having these discussions with your children at a very young age. That hey, you're going to see this on TV if you watch it, but understand that this is Islamically not right. Now in terms of counseling and talking of these issues, this is what I would call a fard kifaya. That part of the community has to stand up and provide the service. And if we don't, then all of us are sinful. And that is why it's so important to have Muslims diversify their fields of education. Right? How many engineers do we have? People with an engineering background, raise your hands. Okay? How many accountants do we have? Accountants? A few accountants? What else? Do we have any doctors here? One doctor? Alhamdulillah. Okay, now let's look at... Psychologists. How many psychologists here? No psychologists. Let's look at even something else. A counselor or a therapist. We have one counselor. So I mean, these are, these are like needs of the community. So when we talk about acts of ibadah, as a Muslim, if you were to choose a field of study that the Muslim community desperately needs, 
that whole process of education becomes an act of ibadah. And I'm sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put so much barakah in your risk that you will not regret that decision whatsoever because you're providing a service to the Muslim community. So I believe as a Muslim community, we need to provide these counseling services. But inshallah, I'm hoping that on a separate day, we'll discuss this issue in detail. Kishan, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, um, so I have a son who's almost three years old. Yeah. And I always wonder, what's kind of, what is the earliest age that I uh, introduced the concept of God to him, uh, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he, I take him, you know, he sees us pray and take it to Friday prayer from time to time. But I always wonder, do I introduce that concept to him kind of in a structured way? Or, you know, kind of in an ad hoc, kind of organic way, you know, any advice on that? Excellent. So in terms of teaching, you want to have different philosophies. And I think you need to find a philosophy that works best for you. What I find that works best with children is just having a natural approach. So for example, when I eat and drink with my right hand, I'll pose a question to my daughter, do you know why I'm eating and drinking with my right hand? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to do so. Or, hey, you know, this is what happened, and I spoke the truth. Do you know why I spoke the truth? Because even though no one else is watching me, I know that Allah knows what's in my heart. So these sort of things, you take life as an opportunity to teach and to engage. Right, I think what we've done wrong is as a community, we only have considered education. If you come to a halakha, you get educated, but you live life separately outside. Islam is the way of life, and that is the way we should be teaching our children. That you actively tell them, why are you doing these things? And that is why the most important part of being a parent is being a good role model. There's no such thing as having Islamically cognizant children if you're not a good role model yourself. The two can't exist simultaneously. So I think as long as you're making that effort, explain to your children why you're doing these things, right? Why do we pray five times a day? Because this is what Allah wants us to do. And slowly as they start to realize and hear this name Allah, they're like, who is Allah? Well, they'll understand that Allah is the Creator. And you'll be surprised that, you know, even my, my, with my daughters, they're, they're six and eight now, they've never asked, you know, why can't we see God, or why is God hiding, or any of those complicated questions we're afraid of. Like we hide from these discussions because like, we don't have answers to these, so let me just shy away from it. But Allah has naturally put in their fitrah that they accept God. They don't need to see God to understand who God is. And I think when we have these teaching opportunities throughout the day, that's when it becomes a lot more palatable than rather once a week, okay, let's study Islam together as a family. That's just my opinion. But like I said, in, like we can do, discuss this inshallah. Question? Yeah. Okay, just can we get you the mic inshallah? Hisham can get him the mic. And then we'll go to the sister after that inshallah. I was going to ask you about the, about the Muslim career day. Yes. Is that like celebrating like homosexuals or like what, what, celebrating Muslim yes. homosexuals? Or what? That Muslim career day, what they're trying to do is help Muslims that are in the closet come out of the closet. Oh, okay. That's okay. what it was about. So my question is, uh, I don't know how to word it. It's like, okay, so like how... If like so that there's one sheikh I think uh, Yasser Qadi like your friend a friend of yours he's saying that like for like the LGBT community like we should work together or we should like I think he's like pushing towards like in that direction yes and like some most like Muslim scholars are saying you know we we can't work together because like we're like two different com- two completely different lifestyles right of course so like can we work together or like should we like if we like we're lobbying together for like one cause or should we like push for their rights but yeah because if they get more rights then we'll also as like a minority we'll also get more rights right of course so can we like push for their rights but yeah let them do what they want to do but like we're not going to take part in that kind of thing or we're not going to like support it but I guess we are kind of supporting it so I don't I don't know yeah, I understand where you're coming from um, can we just start passing the mic backwards oh you have another question after, after I answer this question <laughs> Okay, so in terms of, like, there's two important principles that need to be understood over here. Number one is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ta'awunu al birri wa taqwa, wa la ta'awunu al ithmi wal udwan. Right? Cooperate with one another in righteousness and goodness, and do not, do not cooperate with one another in sin and in vice. Then the other is the statement, wa laysa ba'd al kufri dhamb, that after the sin of disbelief, all sins after that become many um, minute and, and petty. So now when we talk about human rights and cooperating in goodness, like I said, after kufr there is no greater sin, right? So if you're willing to cooperate with someone who is a disbeliever in things that are mutually beneficial to both of you, why will we separate, you know, separate that concept from someone that is from the LGBT community? So that's the first thing that needs to be understood. Number two is that the cooperation that we're working towards 
is equal rights for all. That there should not be any discrimination towards anyone. Yeah. Right? So as a Muslim or a non-Muslim, as a white, as a black, as a, an Arab, as a non-Arab, whatever it is, equal rights for all. That's what we're pushing for. Now, what this needs to be understood is we will not change our morality for this. Right? Our morality cannot be compromised. If someone says, hey, look, you know, lobbying for equal rights for all, now perform a nikah for two men or for two women. I draw the line there because my morality is drawn. That Allah has told me that nikah can only take place between a man and a woman. However, if you choose to have a legal marriage in the, court, in the eyes of the court of Canadian law, by all means, go and do so. I will not stop you from doing that. But when it comes to the realm of religion, the ultimate authority is Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu and not any of us over here. So those boundaries and parameters need to be understood. Can we push, can we push for that though? Like, like, yeah, you can go have your marriage or whatever. But uh, it, like, it, it, it shouldn't be framed in that way. It shouldn't be framed in that way. It should be framed in equal rights for all and lack of discrimination. That's how it should be framed. So about the Playboy thing, like I was going to ask you, like how much have they rebranded? Are they like, are they still wearing like bikinis? Are they just not naked? Or are they wearing like suits? Like, you know, like fashion kind of thing? Or like how much has been rebranded? Because if it's been rebranded completely, then I don't think it's like that bad of like, thing. But like I said, Playboy is not just a magazine. It's a whole entire industry. They have channels, they have other things that are all under Playboy. But the magazine itself has rebranded itself. Now in terms of actually getting to the question, I don't know to what degree. But what I can tell you is one of the articles that I used to, to prepare this from is an article on Islam 21C. So you go to Islam 21C and you look up for the article on this Playboy incident. It actually talks about how they've rebranded and structured. And they said they, like Playboy's big selling point was that they used to have a center fold of, of a nude woman. Like the main middle article was about a nude woman. They no longer have that where she's fully nude, but she's just partially nude. Right? So that's like the restructuring of branding. Like I said, as a Muslim, our understanding of morality is very different from a non-Muslim, right? So, can, can you use that as like... I mean, if some people... I guess people that, that are arguing for it, they're saying, yeah, it's good publicity, right? And there's no... Such but like I said, is there, is there, when we go to a strip club and give dawah, yeah. is that good dawah? So that's a very extreme example. <laughs> this is the exact same thing. This is a, 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 this is a physical manifestation of a strip club in your hand, yeah. right? <laughs> that's what it is. Allah okay. Ta'ala, no. Can we pass the mic back, inshallah? Just pass it back. He's going to the sister section. Just get one of the kids to take it to the back, inshallah. Yes, my friend. Sure, inshallah. What time is Isha? Isha is at 8.40. So we'll be concluding in the next 10 minutes, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I just had a kind of a question in regards to what you were saying about the, like, say, LGBT community, say, within our own community. Um, I understand about us being tolerant to this, and we won't say accepting because we know that it's wrong and it's haram. But my thing is, is if we show so much tolerance, they might get the wrong message that hey. We're accepted, even though it is goes against Islam. But hey, we're being so tolerant. We're being, and I'm I'm all about equal rights and everything. But if they see so much tolerance and equality, that it might send such a negative message that, you know, especially to maybe younger people or say some Muslims that are having these tendencies that, hey, while well, we're accepted, this is okay, um, you know. So how do you how do you define I guess, not to find that, or just kind of find the balance and then move away from them thinking that, hey, there's still equality, we're going to be accepted no matter what, whether we're, we have these tendencies or not. Okay. So I think, like I said, we're going to have a much larger discussion on that topic on a separate day. But in, in summarizing my response, I would say that we cannot compromise in our faith. So when the parameters of halal and haram are approached, it always goes back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. But at the same time, if someone has fallen into this, we can't say that they're not allowed into the masjid. Or we can't say we're not going to engage them as a Muslim community. So I think what's important over here is to have open and frank discussion 
in the wisest of ways. Right? We articulate what we have to say in the best possible fashion without compromising on who we are. So this is going to be something we're going to have to navigate through as a community, but I definitely believe that it can be done. And in terms of giving them rights, I don't believe that if we give anyone rights, it will mean that we're all the same. Right? People understand that people are different. People aren't as... Um, I, don't want to, I don't know what word to use. But people aren't... Uh, actually, that's I shouldn't say that. People aren't as... People are more sensical, or people make more sense than we think or expect them not to. So I think open and frank discussion, know your parameters, articulate it well with wisdom. That's what, that would be the way forward. But inshallah, like I said, we're going to have a separate halak on that topic, and inshallah, we can discuss it more then. Are there any other sisters with comments or questions? <laughs> try, try again. Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay. Um, I just had two quick comments about the, some of the discussion that was going on. Yes. So one was around like uh, educating our women more because I, I guess they're moms and so they're educating the, the kids that are coming up. Of course. Um, and so from that perspective, I think it's also uh, good to let the brothers know that we they need the support from their uh, dads or husbands. That, when there are halakas, for example, specifically to women, um, or there are like women teachers that are coming out, we need to go out and support those initiatives, right? So, of like course. when we had the halakas, for example, like the uh, the one you held, yes. it, was, it was like it was good, but it's so hard to get people to come out sometimes, like right. with like Hayat al Muslim and the different conferences that happen in Calgary. So, just a, I guess a plug in for you the You heard brothers. it here first, <laughs> setting the brothers straight, support the sisters' initiative. If there's a halakha, make sure that they're able to attend, inshallah. Yeah. Um, and the other one was also around the interaction that uh, brothers have with with sisters or with other people. Um, so in the same kind of uh, situation where like a lot of like our sisters are working at like Walmart or things like that, where you're like customer service or even at other places. Right. I find there's a very weird interaction when it comes with extremely between weird Muslim sisters weird. and brothers. It's like for everybody else it's okay, mm. but when they have like we don't know how to interact. Right. Which makes it very weird and difficult in even professional settings like I that I found. So of course. No, that is a I wonderful so point. Sorry. And I agree that like, when you see another Muslim, why is it so awkward? Right? Why is it that we're shy to say assalamu alaikum and ask them how they're doing? There's nothing wrong with saying assalamu alaikum and how you're doing as a professional courtesy. Like we say to everyone else, why is it we discriminate against other Muslims? So in these sort of situations, I think we need to get over that awkwardness that there's nothing wrong with saying assalamu alaikum to the opposite gender as long as your heart is pure. Like don't do it with the sake of sparking up a conversation and trying to get married to her. Do it with the sake of saying assalamu alaikum to, the, to, to your fellow brother or sister. That's the way it should be. Like, purity of the heart is of the utmost importance. And it shouldn't be awkward. And I think the sister makes a, a very valid point. Now, I want to get back to the first point that she's raising. As men, what are we doing to help our sisters increase their iman and increase their Islamic education? Right? So as a man, you have a responsibility in your household that Islam is being propagated properly. And what that means is, at the simplest level, couple of times a week, the man needs to take care of the children so the woman can Islamically develop. If she wants to attend a halakha, she wants to listen to a lecture online, whatever she wants to do to increase herself Islamically, you have to facilitate that. You know, bite the bullet, take care of your children, change some diapers, you know, chase after your kids, whatever it takes. And on top of that, even more than that, it's not just for Islamic education, sisters need time off as well. You can't just expect them to, you know, live their whole entire lives, you know, day in and day out, just taking care of the household. They need time to socialize amongst themselves, they need time to vent, they need time to do fun and creative things, just like all the brothers do. So from time to time, please take care of your children, you know, show your wife that you love and care for her, by giving her no responsibility for those few hours. I don't say day, because I know we can't handle a day, but at least for a few hours, right? It's the least we can do, inshallah. So I'll take one last, I'll ask two questions inshallah and then we break for Salat al Isha. Who is the brother? Actually, Abu Bakr? Is there another brother? Uh, uh, yeah, another one. Is, is there any other brothers that have a question? Okay, so we'll conclude with these two. I'll come and go to Abu Bakr and I'll come to you inshallah. Abu Bakr, go ahead. Uh, yes, Shaykh, I just mind. 
the word you said about the Muslims and Polo. Yes. I think, you know, not the only, not, not the only cause, but I think, see, uh, we have a lot of young men and women who are at the age of perfect marriage, they can marry. Right. However, when a brother goes to a family, <laughs> as a small marriage, he's, this, there's this, what we call demands, as though they want to sell the, 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 the sister to the brother. And the brother cannot afford, so what happens? The consequence is that the sisters, then sometimes, you know, these are like him have been experience. So what happens is that, like, you know, they get, you know, I know, that's the difficulty that I know, a sister would have a relationship with a non-Muslim young man. Right. Because, you know, she cannot address a shower in a proper way. Of course. Because the, the family blocked it. Right. So this is probably one of the causes that, as I said, we don't have to go to Pakistan, India, Somalia, or anywhere else, like here in Calgary. Right. That this is happening. No, that is a very real problem. And what I would say to this is that over here it's important to, you know, increase our own education and know that if a father or a wali is making ridiculous demands, then there are ways around that that the Sharia will accommodate too. So that is when you approach the Imam, get the Imam involved, or a person of knowledge, and you find a way through. So just as a simple answer, if a man and a woman agree to the terms of the mahar, let's just say $100,000, and they want to get married to each other, but the man knows he can't afford it, and the woman knows that as well, so they are allowed to agree to whatever amount they want before the marriage, and as soon as the nikah is done, the woman is allowed to say, I've pardoned for you your debt. It is a, a, a completely permissible thing. So even though the father may be extremely demanding, if the woman has iman and taqwa, she'll know to make things easy. So I think there are other ways around, and this is not an excuse to, to fall into haram. I understand that's not what you're saying. But I'm saying the sharia is very accommodating, and we need to find the ways that the sharia accommodates. To add to this, not only has marriage become difficult, but look how easy it is to fall into zina. Zina is so easy, so cheap, subhanAllah. So as a community, we need to wake up to that. And I'd also add to that the importance of education. I can't emphasize that enough. Especially when it comes to gender interaction, we need to have more open and frank discussion. Jazakallah khair. And last question for the evening. Actually, I don't know where the mic is anymore. Where is the mic? Okay, can we get someone to pass it forward? One of the young kids, go and get it. No, but I never said to push for homosexual rights. I never said that. Yeah, so understand that term. That as a Muslim, our standpoint is equal rights for all and no discrimination against anyone. Right? We don't specifically target a group. When you specifically target a group, we're already discriminating. What does that mean, do whatever you want? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think again it's very important to but I don't know what that means like what does that term mean just like if you like have your sexual orientation yeah just like yeah do whatever you want I don't know but like yeah just like be who you are okay of, and just like live life yeah but what what, what like what is, what is the I guess positive effect or negative effect of that statement like, isn't that what we're saying anyways? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, what I was going to say was, because she was saying, I think the sister was saying that, like, if we push for their rights, then, we're gonna, then they're going to, like, get the wrong idea, and then you're saying... So, no. And then if we, we tolerate them, that they're going to get the wrong idea. If we tolerate them. Yeah. yeah. So, but doesn't that, like, isn't that, like, where it starts? So, like, if we, let's say... But I'm saying, if we're open and frank about what our stance is from the beginning, yeah. that this is what my dean says, this is what my morality is, yeah. and within those parameters, I'm still going to defend you in terms of any forms of discrimination, you have to, you know, accept it as that package, or reject it as that package. I understand that, Right? Yeah. But, okay, so, like, the more conservative Islamic stance would be, like, you can't even say something like that, right? Like, I'm the more conservative like, Islamic colors. stance means go back to Muslim countries and... You know, live within Islamic states. Exactly. Right? Right. So I'm saying, as a result of this, like supporting them in the beginning, or saying something like that. Like, like I said, we're not talking about supporting them. No one has ever said supporting them. Like, don't like misquote that. Not supporting them, but just <laughs> what you what you said. Yes. Yeah. Open, equal rights for all, yeah. without discrimination. Well, saying something like that. Yes. I have no problem with that statement. Yeah. And Islamically, I don't believe there's a problem with that either. There's not a compromising of our but then faith. Then we're kind of like tolerating it, right? So then, once we tolerate it. I'm saying, like, eventually, we're gonna lead. We're gonna 
people who are going to start tolerating them, and then they're going to like get the wrong idea. No, and that's the thing. Part of and this that's and that's condition is having a clear, explicit message in an articulated fashion with wisdom. Yeah. So we're never compromising our principles, nor we're compromising what we say. What we're talking about is that when you have something Islamic to say, just phrase it properly, right? So phrasing it properly, even if you phrase it properly, I'm just saying that eventually it can lead it can lead to something like a Muslim queer day. Eventually, you know, we, we phrase it properly. I don't believe it. And no, then I believe it end up somewhere else. Uh, and then they're going to be like, yeah, let's tolerate them. And then there's going to be gay Muslims. And this this argument that you're day. making is the equivalent of a slippery slope argument. That if I leave my house, I'm going to get hit by a car. There are chances that if you leave your house, you might get hit by a car. The probability of happening is, is not very likely. And like I said, the key thing over here is not looking at this issue in isolation. Education of Islam in general needs to be increased. And any institute that is, is uh, you know, educating people about Islam, support those institutes to get the true Islamic message out there. We have enough organizations and institutes that are promoting um, a pacifist, watered-down version of Islam. And when authentic voices stay quiet, that is when those problems happen. But when authentic voices are empowered and is done in a proper way, that I think is in the benefit of the Muslim community. Okay. Allah Ta'ala. That was just for the sake of argument. No, that's good. I appreciate that. Jazakallah khair. <laughs> khair. Let's conclude with that. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Say one more thing. Oh sure, go ahead. It's like a small... We have three minutes before the karma. Okay, so like... Yeah, just like to add what the brother was saying about the, you know, Muslim pornography, like Muslim watching pornography and all that stuff on the rise. How can we like kind of like stop that? Because like people are getting married at like 25, 26 and like they need to fulfill their desire before that. You know? Yeah. That's what I'm going to You want me to answer that in three minutes? <laughs> Allah, Allah knows best. And that's like, Should they get married younger? What's the I mean, marriage is not a solution to problems, right? Not marriage is when people are mature enough and ready enough to get married, they should get married. And marriage is not just about physical intimacy, it is about responsibility and accountability and building a pathway to Jannah together. So, right? so people make marriage as a, you know, focused on intimacy, but that's not really what it is. So I believe, again, there needs to be a more holistic approach that starting off from a young age, we have net manis on our internet so that children don't have access to it. Number two, monitoring who our kids' friends are, that they shouldn't have bad influences on them. Number three, having open and frank discussions with them that, hey, this world of pornography exists, this is why it's bad for you. Look at the statistics of what it does to the mind. Look at the, the statistics of how it leads to depression and how it ruins people's marriages. And use that approach. And as they get older, instill taqwa in them, that even though mama and baba can't see you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching you. Like those are the beginning steps that we need to start with young children. And then as we get older, the issue of facilitating marriage and regularly fasting and staying in good environments will all come into play. But Allah knows best. May Allah protect us all. Okay, we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shahadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Mm-hmm.